morning, everybody. Welcome to Groundswell. Um, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> uh, the, the intention this morning is for the five of us just to have a, um, a general discussion about how we got into the regenerative mindset and, um, and the process that we've gone through to get to where we are now. Um, I, we, we were talking about it earlier and we, we felt that it's the, because the whole point of this is a discussion, it's probably best if people have questions, if you stick your hands up and we, we take them as we go along. Um, no guarantees that we'll be able to answer them, but we'll, we'll do our best. I'm Ian Davis, um, small livestock farmer from about 20 miles south of here, uh, or I was until recently. I've just gone on, on the point of retiring to focus on uh, environmental things. Um, we'll, we'll run through a, a quick introduction from each of us first, and then we'll jump straight into the discussion. Hi, um, I'm Angus Dalton. I'm a first-generation farmer, having come through the council holding system um, from a non-farming family in the south. Uh, and now uh, my wife and I partnership with my son and daughter-in-law farmer out right on the edge of the Peak District. We milk 500 cows on a 100% grass-fed system, uh, milking once a day. And we've also diversified into um, ice cream and dairy products. Um, the ice cream, which you'll see here, uh, hopefully. Uh, and um, yeah, we have uh, some of the dairy products on offer in our honesty shop on the, on the farm as well. Um, yeah, regen wise, it is a journey. It has been a journey. It is a mindset, and we will just no doubt talk about it as we go. Time. Um, hi, my name's Anthony Ellis. Um, I farm uh, 200 acres, small mixed family farm in Cornwall with uh, with my father. We're, um, we've got uh, a reasonable amount of arable within that, and um, we we also have a, a flock of New Zealand Romney sheep. Um, we try to direct market as much of the lamb as we possibly can, um, and uh, yeah, that, that's that's us in a nutshell. So hi, uh, my name's Cal Starker. I'm from uh, the Pennines, South Pennines, West Yorkshire, Lancashire boundary. Uh, predominantly a small holding, 70 acres, uh, just running a couple of cows, carving, spring carvers, and then taking through to stores and selling on from there. Uh, third generation. Yeah, that's about me, really. And Sam? Uh, Sam Audrey uh, from Wiltshire. Uh, currently, um, we're moving in two months' time to Cornwall to be, well, not to be near town, but it, it happens. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, come from a sort of a family farm, sort of diversified family farm with sort of contracting and all sorts um, going on there. But I concentrate on the cattle, um, have moved the cattle from a traditional beef set stocking system through to, well, now sort of total grazing with the Suffolk cows and running, uh, growing cattle on sort of not full herbal lays at the moment, sort of herby lays. Let's call them. Um, and yeah, and that's it. I should just say for anyone who uh, who doesn't already know, the the way we all got together, thanks to Clive at the back there, is uh, the Farming Forum. Um, we're all active members on the Farming Forum and um, we've all been throwing ideas around and uh, criticising each other and insulting each other on there for a long time. Um, that's been a, a, the thing that actually drew us together because it's only at things like Groundswell that we actually meet. Um, power of modern social media. You, you put it in. Do you want to say something about that slide? Oh, um, okay, yeah. Um, <coughs> so um, this, these two slides were um, are taken from a couple of studies. One was done by the EU and the other was done by the um, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, and basically it, it's just showing, um, uh, the reason I put it in is because it shows quite nicely where the um, soil organic carbon and, and the most soil biodiversity lie within the UK and Europe, and what the, the one thing that jumps right out at me is that the most carbon and biodiversity sits in the 
regions of the UK that are predominantly grass-based agriculture, where there's livestock integrated with arable, without arable. But what what that sort of screams to me is that that um, animal-based, pasture-based agriculture is is so integral to um, good soil health um, that that the, it sort of rubbishes the arguments against um, <laughs> um, livestock just in these two two simple slides. It's um, it sums it up perfectly for me. We don't need to discuss anything else. It's all there. Um, kick things off. Uh, I'll start with Angus. How did you get into the idea of regenerative agriculture? Um, well, like you've already alluded to, really, it was it was being on the farming forum, and I I say I suppose I dipped my toe into the the holistic section. Um, which is a bit of a dark area, really. It's a bit like the dark web out there. And I just found that uh, not only was it a welcoming mindset, but a mindset of an exchange of ideas. And um, and then also through it. Cause, and on top of that, I'd seen the need for getting a direct drill. So, um, yeah, it was looking for information on direct drilling as well. And, uh, yeah, it, it the whole thing just opened out, and it just opened my mind at the same time as I was questioning what I was doing at home on the farm. Farming very conventional, looking for yields, pedigree herds, um, milking, cracky. I'd even done the three times a day milking. So, you know, yeah, I'd drop that back to twice, but now I'm at once a day and there's no way we're going, for <laughs> going beyond that again. But, um, yeah, and it was just questioning what I was doing and, and just asking why. And seeing the answers out there on the forum, and not being afraid of having a go, really, um, yeah, doing. The, and, and I suppose the first step, if I look back, the very first step was just looking at my pedigree herd of cattle, and crossbreeding them all. Um, so yeah, a herd of black and whites suddenly turned into a herd of black and whites crossed with brown Swiss, and people thought I was breeding limousines to them. Everyone, you know, all the neighbours driving by thought I was bonkers. You know, a herd full of black cattle, um, and then all of a sudden. You start realising the power of grass, Tony's just said, um, and the bank account just started turning around completely. It, it, it really was a turning point, financially and mentally, and that would have been 2008, nine, round about then, and have just evolved since then. Tony? Um, so, <coughs> full disclosure, um, I am in my spare time. I'm also an agronomist. Um, <laughs> And yeah, exactly. Um, <coughs> and I, I, I guess I had a, a very, very conventional start to my career. I um, had a, did a degree at Harper Adams, went um, and worked for a couple of the big um, agronomy companies, and then <coughs> in 2015, um, becoming thoroughly disillusioned with with that working system, my wife and I emigrated to Australia with no real intention of coming back. Um, and it was out there that I started to, as I was driving to work each day, I started to notice as the drought that they've just come out of started to really bite in sort of 16, 17, um, that there were one or two farmers that were doing things a little bit differently and they were able to keep their stocking numbers up. They always had grass in front of their livestock and over the fence there were guys that were just farming dust and having to destock and um, getting themselves into a, a really bad um, place. And one of the farmers who farmed up in the northern Mount Lofty Ranges had just come back from a busman's tour and did the whole um, Greg Judy, um, uh, Gabe Brown busman's tour thing and started talking about this idea of regenerative agriculture. And that's sort of where I started to hear about it and then joined the dots. Um, and one of the other things that I started to notice is that historically what they, a lot of the things that they did out in Australia to mitigate against drought um, we do in this country to mitigate flood risk. It's all about keeping water in the landscape and, and looking at how water flows through the landscape. And so that was sort of the next light bulb that, that flicked on. Um, and then as I start, started reading more and, and learning more about it, the, the link with carbon started to, that was the, sort of the, the next light bulb. So when you, when you break it all down, it all comes down to the way we manage carbon and water in the landscape. And that's sort of, you start to try and translate 
from an Australian context into a British context and some things work, some things don't, but the, the, the basic principles are the same and that's sort of how I started to, to figure it out. And then when I came home three years ago and came back onto the farm, started to try and change things and do things a bit differently and that's, that's sort of how, how I got into it. Carl? So, yeah, for me, it all started probably around 2017. Um, I, w I wasn't growing no grass compared to what I used to, and I was putting more and more fertilizer on, even though I'm on a small scale in the South, South Pennines, very steep, severely disadvantaged farm. And uh, I thought, I need to change something here, and I didn't know what at the time. And then the, the drought of 2018 hit, and my fa farm's very south facing, very steep, so it, it just burnt off to a cinder, there was nothing left. And then it just evolved from there. I thought I need to work from the ground up. So I did a, some soil testing and got my pH back and then thought, right, I need to get some lime. And then it sort of evolved from there. I couldn't get enough to do any lime spreading because it's only 70 acres of quite seriously steep land. So I ended up having to buy my own lime spreader and it, it sort of expanded from there. Uh, I started doing rotational grazing on half of my mowing land uh, and, and saw the advantages uh, working from there now. Uh, I stopped cutting my own grass, I buy my silage in, and I've sort of gone full circle now on, on my mowing land where I can go back to mowing it, but I'm not using no inputs. It's, it's just predominantly grazing and a bit of, bit of farm yard manure from winter. I'm using no inputs at all, and I'm, I'm actually back mowing these fields that I, I was struggling to before with no grass on. It's just like high density rotational cell grazing now. Sam? Um, I sort of question everything that, everything um, within the family farm <laughs> um, but I sort of I suppose the first time I saw things being done differently was at a museum when I was working for my wife Laura's old man and um, he'd taken over the, his family farm and they'd used a lot of DDT out there to get rid of grass grub which got rid of everything else as well um, and he'd spent his working life using seaweed like Laura remembers as a kid going to the beach and collecting seaweed and him brewing it up and then spraying it on the ground um, and then using um, fish fertiliser as well. And he'd seen the difference in the soil. And then coming back home, I, you know, we were traditionally cut as much silage as we could and then end up having to feed hay out in July that we'd just made, which is <laughs> quite frustrating. Um, and then just sort of changing things and questioning things all the way along, changing the breed of the cattle. Um, and then, in, you know, we're doing contracting and you go out and see these dairy farmers using rotational grazing and strip grazing and think, well, we got cattle why are we set stocking you know why why aren't we making the most of our grass so i started playing around with a bit of that and you know training myself to do electric fencing because having no training it's train yourself to start off with as much as the cattle um and then on the farming forum it's you go onto the dark side like angus said and um you know there's you know, there's a guy called Kiwi Pete there. He's a bit of a nutter, I think. He, you know, trying different things and not using any fertilizer. So I've stopped using fertilizer on the grazing ground. And, you know, my most productive grazing block is a group of suckler cows and calves. Um, <coughs> daily shifts, sometimes twice a day if I've got time. Um, sort of the total grazing sort of concept where it's sort of mowing grass. But they, they eat it all. And last year I carried... 35 cow calf units on 45 acres and it was still slightly understocked um, with no fertilizer. Um, and that was the most productive unit, probably because of the intensity of management. Unfortunately, because of the way the farm's spread out, it's not possible to do it on everything. You have you do it on where you can. Um, yeah, I think does that does that cover everything? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and for me, I the the first I came across was the um, the infamous. Alan Savory TED Talk, um, and that actually got me questioning some of the things that I've been taught for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, so then I went looking for information, and, uh, and like Sam, I found myself in New Zealand in June 2017, and uh, dropped in on, on Pete Blair, and he's a, a real character and uh, forces you to think about things rather differently came home and decided that I ought to know more about it and uh, contacted um, Sheila and Chris at 3LM, the UK Savory Hub, and, uh, and started doing their training. Um, 
So that, that was my way in. So general discussion, guys. Which, uh, what did you find as the biggest hurdle to getting in? You want me to um, go first? <laughs> Shall I speak? Right. Yeah, mindset. It, it, it's just having, it's just having the it's having the confidence to step to step out of your comfort zone. That's all it is, and it is. It's all in your mind, and and no matter what little small change you want to take, or, or or what 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 thing you want to question, don't be afraid of questioning it, and just just have a go, and don't worry about what the neighbours think. Yeah, and and if it doesn't work, what's you know what's what's the worst thing that can happen? I'd, I'd, I'd agree with Angus there. It's mindset is, you know, once you change your top paddock, everything comes a bit easier to sort of see how to do things differently. It's, you know, unless you see, you know, someone can tell you, oh, you've got to go out and shift your cows twice a day, once a day, whatever they choose. Unless you can see the benefits of that and, you know, see the problems with the previous system, you're not going to do it. You're not going to put your heart into it. And it, you know, it'd be too easy to say, oh, it just doesn't work. Tom? Yeah, I think one of the biggest barriers for me was um, working out how to have the conversations. If you're, <laughs> if you're farming with, with family members, um, it's, it's having those conversations and saying that you want to do things a little bit differently and you've got a few harebrained scream schemes that you want to try and trying to convince them that um, you're not barking mad, but actually it might... Um, it might work. And one of the things that, one of the first ones that, that one of those conversations we had was, Dad, I want to get some sheep. Absolutely no fucking way are you getting sheep. <laughs> we sold the effing sheep 20 years ago. I'm not effing well buying anymore. And a fortnight later, oh, I quite like the idea of getting some sheep, actually. And, and all of a sudden, we got, <laughs> we got 40 Romneys turn up. Um, and then, you know, and then you have a conversation, well, I'd, I'd like to graze the winter cereals with the sheep, please. You must be bloody joking. You're not doing that. That's mental. Well... Actually, your granddad used to do that, yeah. And so all of a sudden, you'd, the, the conversations just start to happen, but they just take a bit of time. And, and, and I guess that's what, you know, that, that's what it all, it all just takes time. It is this thing, isn't it, that, um, that we've, we've all been, probably a, a bit of a strong word to use, but indoctrinated for so long into the, the conventional way of doing things. And it takes a big jump to actually start questioning that and start looking at looking at everything and saying, why do we do this? Once you start doing that, then everything else follows from that. Um, anything to add? Yeah, for, for me, we're predominantly what the neighbour's going to say when I started. <laughs> uh, I have a, a couple of farmers above me that drive past every day and say, oh, you're going to mow that? I say, no, no, I'm not just going to put electric fence around it and, and bang the cows in it and they'll be on daily moves or 12-hourly moves. And then just not being scared to do something out of the box. I, I just thought, back, like I said, back in 2018, I'm going to have to do something different here. It's, it's not earning no money. Uh, and I just took the big leap for that year, of the next two years, about all my age in, rather than trying to make any. And I could buy better quality in than I could make as well. And then, uh, so I put a bit, probably eight acres back into the rotation. But I'm, I'm getting a lot more. I've really extended the years, the, the, end, the, the shoulders of the years now by doing what I've done, even though I'm buying in. So what unexpected problems have we all come across? I'll, I'll uh, kick off with, with this one. This is one of the, the, the eye-openers I had. Um, everyone talks about moving cattle frequently and the problems with it. Biggest problem I had was getting cattle to water. The, these two aerial photos, the one on the left was my attempt at cell grazing in 2018. I had a water tank in the middle of the field, and you can bloody see that's where the water tank was. Um, now, OK, the, the right-hand picture was taken early in the year, but that was two years later. Um, in the meantime, I um, made that water tank, which I just drag around from cell to cell as I move them with a, um, the old suicide trike. Um, on, on 200 metres of blue MDPE. I think the whole thing cost me uh, about 150, 160 quid to sort out. Um, and that's enabled me to actually keep the animals in a particular place without having to go back to the water all the time. So um, what observations has everyone else got? 
Um, I think probably the the biggest hurdle or the biggest unexpected problem was was livestock hu husbandry. I mean, I'm a I'm an agronomist. I I know how to grow crops, but learning how to farm sheep. Like I said, we the last of our livestock left the farm 20 years ago, and um, so I I've very heavily relied on Dad remembering how to farm sheep, and then. Um, because we, you know, we're doing things a slightly different way to the way he did it 20 years ago. You got to find the right people to talk to and mentor you through those difficult first lambing seasons and all those sorts of things, and, and trying to figure out how these woolly things work. Um, um, so that that's probably the biggest hurdle that, that we've had to, or the unexpected hurdle. Angus. Yeah, a big a big hurdle really came. Um, again, part of the mindset thing. We used to uh, we used to send our heifers away for contract rearing for the winter, and uh, it's, a, it's a big bill. At the end of the winter, you know, it's, it's you know 100, 120 heifers away each each winter for for five months um, is a lot of money. And then we just said, no, we'll winter them out at home. And you go through that horrible period in the middle of winter um, where there's there's two weeks of absolutely shit weather, you know, and it's just soul-destroying going out there, moving fences. And th but then when you look back after the winter, you think, was it really that bad? You know, April comes and everything's just moving forward on, on, the, on the grassland. And because they're only heifers as well, um, they didn't actually do that much soil down. It looked worse than it was. So, again, this is one of the... the things you, you look at it and think oh it's, it's going to be a nightmare but it, it it never was you know what and what we've done now also is actually moved away from kale and bales more to deferred grass and bales deferred grass will carry stock through the winter better than um obviously a crop but the crop did provide an ent entry for the new grass the following spring um but the unexpected consequence of that to our benefit was that we actually started making serious money. Yeah, and I'll say this now, we never, as a business, we never started making a serious profit until we started wintering animals out. Don't be afraid of wintering animals out. This, that's one of the, that's probably the, the holy grail of, um, of uh, holistically managed livestock, really. The, something like 50% of all of our costs is from bringing the animals in for the winter and then carting the food to them and then carting the shit back out to the fields and spreading it. And it, if you can take, take that out, then it's almost difficult not to make a profit. It's just how do you do it without wrecking everything? Um, I'm sharing uh, Angus's favourite photo of uh, a, right. wet, a wet day on a <laughs> cell. That, that was actually taken on the 12th of June, that was. Um, and again, you look over the hedge at that, which I'm sure a lot of people did... <laughs> And think, what on earth are you up to now? Um, you, and if you walk around the farm, you wouldn't be able to identify that patch now. Um, but again, it's just not being afraid of it, you know. And there, hundred, there'd, there'd have been a hundred heifers there on probably acre, acre and a half for twenty-four hours, and twenty-four hours, and probably an inch and a half of rain. Yeah, but um, it will recover. You know, don't lose faith. But the 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 24 hours is the important bit. We all we can all think of examples where we've had animals out, perhaps over winter, and you've chewed ground up, and they've been on there day after day after day, and made a right mess, gone right through, and it's just mud as deep as your Wellingtons. But if they're only there for 24 hours, how much damage can they do? And then once you move them on, the 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 long rest periods that you create by using these these small cells and the, the high intensity of grazing give the, the ground so much time to recover. And it, it's just having the, having the faith to take that chance and actually see beyond it. And it, even when it looks like that, if you actually go and walk across it, um, most of that's just mud that's come up to the surface. The, the grass is still there under, uh, underneath all that mud. You haven't broken the surface in the way that you would if you left uh, that bunch of kettle, cattle out there on that same piece of ground for for a month in the middle of winter but but what's interesting now and it, it, and even even when we're doing our wintering out on it and again on deferred grassland now and we'll, and we'll move them every 24 hours you'll you'll get mud like you'll leave a sea of mud on a, on a wet spell 
And then again, within 24 hours afterwards, that sea of mud is just full of worm casts. You can just see it all coming back to life in front of you the following day. You know, and that's actually quite, ex it's quite exciting. <laughs> Sad, but it's quite exciting to see <laughs> it happen, you know, yeah. Yeah, some of, some of my non-farming colleagues think I'm absolutely barking mad because I get excited about, um, about cow pats. <laughs> and uh, dung beetles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And looking at how long it takes for the, for the dung to break down and whether the cycling's effective and things like that. Um, and that, that's been a real eye-opener for me. And not just for me. Um, I, for anyone who doesn't know, I started, uh, I went back to academia 12 months ago and doing a, a um, master's degree at the moment. And um, you you explain to some of the academics that um, that you can actually get a, a very rapid recovery in natural function once you stop trying to poison everything. And we, as livestock farmers, we tend to think, oh, we're not doing that. But 90% of all the wormers we pour on the backs of our animals get excreted in the dung. Is it any wonder our dung beetles have all died? Um, and I, I've seen that very rapidly changing on our place. Um, you end up with this, this beneficial, virtuous cycle where because you're moving the animals um, too, too quickly for the, the worm life cycle to actually function, you can back off on the, on the, um, the veterinary treatments. Uh, our vet costs dropped right away. And... Um, and then everything starts to recover. If you give nature the chance, it really does start to recover. The first change, the first um, change that you take, is very much a leap of faith. But once you actually start seeing things happen, um, and you start questioning everything, then that's when when the, the real magic starts to happen. Anyone? Yeah, yeah. Just like I said, question everything. Assume you're wrong in what you're doing. Um, you might not be. You might be, um, and look at look at other options. For what you're doing, like you said, the um, the reduced use of uh, vet meds. You know, we always have to about this time of year use fly treatments for the cattle on the longer rotations. Last year on the block I mentioned before, they didn't need it. Um, everything else needed it. It was man managed on a different style of grass management. Um, but no, they didn't need it, and it was it was quite nice actually. Not not to have to get them in and. Apart from you know the cost isn't massive, but in the actual treatment itself, but the um, yeah your time and everything else gives you more time for um, shifting cows. <laughs> but going back to the um, the question we seem to have forgotten about <laughs> the problems um, problems are infrastructure and time. Um, you're you're limited in the time you've got and sort of accepting that not everything's going to be perfect. And you know what can be achieved by shifting them twice a day, once a day. But actually, every other day is probably all right as well, as long as you know, because that will meet your sort of holistic goals by shift more by shifting them sort of every other day rather than daily. It gives you more time with family, which is, after all, the most important thing there is. Angus, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to sort of chip in on there on, on the on the back of his fly treatment. And again, this is an unexpected thing from milking cows once a day. You don't do afternoon milking, so you don't get flies in the parlour. You don't treat your cows with fly spray. Carl? Yeah, for, for me, one of the biggest issues, is like Ian and Sam said, it were uh, inf infrastructure, uh, water, predominantly water. How can I get it from like doing whatever shapes to get back to a water trough? So... I ended up dragging a load of, load of underground pipe in and various spots, and obviously my land's very very awkward and very sh silly shaped, really, so I, I was working in triangles like Ian, and I, I w I'm making a mess of the water spots. I thought, I need to do something different here. That was probably burnt up to a cinder in, in 18. There was nothing left on it. Uh, that was last year, and it looks exactly the same again now. And it's just had an extra six weeks rest through rotational grazing elsewhere. Uh, that area is a lump of land. I mean, we have to do a lot of work on because there's only water in, in one area. Uh, so cows have to like, mob graze there and go back every day for the water. Um, I'm going to hopefully look into the, the, the collars to, to move them around as such. And then 
try and drag some water in from a stream and siphon it and one thing or another and I, I couldn't hopefully move a trough frame with that and the collars because of obviously I've no mains water up there or anything like that. You were saying last night that an, another major problem that you've got is the fact you're crisscrossed by footpaths. Yeah, footpaths nightmare. So I think I think the collars going forward, if, if they do work as well as what a neighbour says, I think it could be a real game changer for me because I can put them there and not have to put any electric fences up and people can get round them without, without any hindrance. Yeah, for some reason the county rights away teams don't seem to like electric fencing across footpaths. <laughs> and, and an awful lot of people seem to um, seem to enjoy doing their best to uh, to interfere with them. Um, the the field of mine that I showed you earlier, actually, you probably saw on the photo, it backs onto one of the country's biggest gypsy sites. Um, and I was terrified of uh, of using electric fencing there when I first started doing it on that field. Um, in the space of one year, I think I lost nine batteries off electric fences. Um, and then I finally thought about it a bit differently and stuck a mains electric fencer in and um, locked in one of the farm buildings and ran a lead-out cable and put a, a, um, a live hotline right around the perimeter of the farm, which I pick up from uh, for all of the cells. And uh, pretty much problem went away. Um, in fact, I wish I'd been there to see some of the... Uh, some, some of the some of the traveller kids on the one occasion they did try to move some of my electric fencing because I know when when I accidentally touch it it done off bloody hurt. It's uh, it's a high powered unit producing a shock of about twelve thousand volts. So um, yeah, the, that was one of my challenges definitely. And it, just by thinking about it a bit differently and putting a little bit of thought into the infrastructure, the the problem really has gone away. Um, in the last two years, I haven't had any interfe interference there at all. Advice. Where do you get your advice from? Who do you listen to? Who don't you listen to? Um, anyone? I get my advice from you, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do Bl I. Blind leading the blind. <laughs> um, no, I, I guess that's um, that's been a... It's always going to be a little bit of a problem. I, I, I'm a fairly prolific reader, and I, I've read lots and lots and lots and lots um, of books on the subject, but that doesn't really... Um, compare with getting stuck in and doing it yourself and, and learning as you go um, and not being afraid of making those mistakes which you know we all do um, but it finding the right people to, to just bounce ideas off and people that have got a similar mindset and, uh, and are happy to make the mistakes with you and go along with you and learn with you that's 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 really important and I'm, I've been very fortunate in that I've got um, friends on, in in this country and um in Australia and New Zealand that have, that have helped us along that um, along the way. Yeah, predominantly most of my info has come off, off the TFF, really. So I don't really have time for, for books and things like that or newspapers, so it's more of a dinner break, once I put dot to bed sort of time, an hour here, an hour there, just on, on, on my phone, having a quick read, really. And I went from there and, yeah, just evolved. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just sort of the same sort of thing, really. It's what the other two have said um reading um you know been through savory's book and multiple others um and then tff and just trying things you know because you're going to learn best from your own mistakes so just keep keep trying things and keep getting things wrong because then if you get something wrong then you know you know give yourself some feedback on what you can do better next time um that's sort of yeah how you learn yeah um Similar to the others, really, uh, the farming forum uh, is a is an absolute mine of information. However, like all advice, you take all that advice and then actually you do make your own mind up from it. You know, there's a lot of rubbish on there, but there's a hell of a lot of good stuff on there. And don't underestimate the power of social media. Um, books. I read Alan Savory's book, which sort of gave the principles of holistic management and again just the way you approach things and the thought process that was good um with regards to regen farming I would, an easy read and an easy first read would be gabe brown's book dirt to soil um which, which again just set it all and i could relate to it because he was a farmer who was genuinely struggling for okay different reasons and he knew things had to change and then i went through that thought process as well of changing things um so, yeah, 
Um, as for trusted advisors like colleges and consultancies, um, the older I get, the more cynical I get. Um, and uh, yeah, just yeah, take that advice, but then make your own mind up. For God's sake, don't. I think the word trusted is very loosely applied there. I'd sort of um, carry on from there with the trusted advisors and the regenerative label. It's coming quite fashionable. And there seems to be a lot of companies jumping on the bandwagon offering their advice. Um, <laughs> and a lot more products coming out. Whereas actually, the, f the first thing you want to do is stop spending. You know, do what you can with what you've got, your land, your soil, yourself, your mind, um, before going out and spending some money at one of these shiny tents out here. <laughs> They'll cripple you for that. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, the other thing I would say is uh, I hate to um, put money into the, the hands of tech entrepreneurs, but um, there's some fantastic stuff, some very good videos from various people on Facebook as well. Um, there are some really interesting um, advice groups and, and uh, information sharing groups. Uh, the regenerative, regenerative Grazing Group is a good one. Uh, and there's a number of others like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I share the cynicism with the rest of the, the panel here about um, the fact that an awful lot of the traditional agricultural advice industry have suddenly discovered the re regenerative tag. Um, and there's an awful lot of questions that I would want to ask a traditional advisor who comes onto the farm to, to advise me how to develop my business in a regenerative direction before I actually accepted that uh, that their heart was in the right place. Um, particularly in the current environment, I think an awful lot of the the, the well-meaning money that the government's putting into um, advice for the agriculture sector is being seen as just an opportunity to continue the gravy train for, for these organisations. And I'll probably shoot myself in the foot by saying that, but um, I, that's a... a view that I hold quite strongly. I mean, if, if you find someone that's good or a product that's good, latch onto it for dear life and use yeah. it to your to your advantage. You know, they will gain out of it as well, obviously, by yeah. you paying them. But um, you know, use it to your advantage the best. But make sure you test it and question it all the way through. And you have to bear in mind with, with all of this that it's um, that what works on one farm won't necessarily work on another farm. Um, just because your, your neighbour or your friend has had fantastic success with a particular approach doesn't necessarily mean it'll work for you. Um, it might be worth trying, and one of the, the best ways forward is to actually make a point of, of um, trying to create safe-to-fail areas and trying things out. Um, with, with grazing in particular, there can be some big differences in, in the response you get depending on the, the stock density at the time. So um, the, the traditional response when you talk about moving two or three times a day is, oh my God, how are you going to find time to do that? Um, but if you can get the cells really small and move the animals that sort of frequency, then you start to see much much quicker um, improvements in the, in the soil health and the biological functioning. And you've got to remember that once you get things really, really ticking along, then you're spending virtually no, no time, if any time, um, throwing fertilisers around, no time harrowing fields behind the cattle, um, much less time, if any, um, producing winter feed for, for animals if you can move towards being able to outwinter. All of that time that we're all so used to spending in tra on tractor seats going out and doing stuff um, that that's really benefiting other people rather than ourselves. That's where an awful lot of our cost comes from. And we've lost the art of actually spending time with our livestock, watching them, seeing what they do, um, questioning it. Well, why, did it. why did that one eat that plant and not that one? Um, I mean, the, the, another classic one in the regenerative field is, um, is the discussion about weeds. What's a weed? Well... You know, the conventional wisdom is that you go in and spray out nettles and thistles and docks and things like that, but they've all got fantastic nutrient profiles. And in the right situation, livestock will eat them. Um, 
the protein content of docs can be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we one of the one of the first things that I notice is that because we graze all our sheep under solar panels, we've got a 35 acre block of solar panels, and so they spend most of the year under under panels. And um, because there's no, we don't, you can't spread any nitrogen under there. There's, it hasn't had nitrogen since the panels went in. The docks are actually quite palatable, and we don't have a dock problem anymore. There are no docks there because they just eat them out. They love them. Um, so yeah, a weed is. It's only a weed if, if you see it as that, um, and the sheep certainly don't. Yeah, and there's a reason why the weeds are there. <coughs> we know that you, know, you get the big jack thistles, they're there because that little patch has been overgrazed. In the past, we had a field out the back of the buildings, which traditionally, you know, cows with problems went in the summer or orphan calves, and they would just let them have the whole paddock, and obviously they'd selectively graze out the different patches and leave the others, and it was a was a mess of thistles, wasn't it, Laura? <laughs> and um, you know, we we've changed that. We we mob grazed it you know, when the cows were in the TB test, and we just chuck the big bunch out there. They'd hammer it down and then leave it. And someone went out with a loader and knocked them all down one day as well, didn't she? <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll just quickly tr touch on this one, which I know everyone's got a view on. Um, how will you know when you've reached your regenerative goal? Do Anybody want, wants to I'll, start? I'll, tell you what, I'll go. Um, well, I don't think you'll ever reach a goal. That's the trouble with certification schemes. They they give you a goal to reach. Um, but actually, if you look at regenerative, you know, to its fullest, you'll get you'll have a target and you'll reach it. But then, if you're questioning everything, you'll then you'll have another target that will present itself and another and another and maybe not the same stream, maybe not in like, say, for example, cattle breeding, it'd be something else and then something else. And I don't think you can ever reach fully regenerative or regenerated or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Sam's kind of hit the nail on the head there. There's, we, we're getting all the regenerative agriculture is kind of in a, a relatively dangerous place at the moment because there's a lot of people trying to define regenerative agriculture to suit their their tick box exercise and they're trying to pigeonhole it and, and as we've sort of alluded to already regenerative agriculture is going to mean something different on every farm probably and it's impossible to to produce I think it's impossible to produce a, a certification scheme or a label to put on regenerative agriculture and 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 try and pigeonhole it like that it's, it's going to be incredibly difficult but um, it's 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 probably just another part of the, the, the gravy train that's, you know, that we've already spoken about. Angus, any thoughts? Um, yeah, when I'm happy, I suppose. Is, yeah, when you can tell, when you just know things are right, you, everyone's got that gut feeling deep down inside. You know if something's not right, and you know, right, I've got to do it better next time. Um, and, um, yeah, uh, and again, looking at... Sam touched on the, the, the family there, you know, the, the um, succession isn't just about plant and farming regenerating itself. The family's coming into the business and the family taking it on as well and, and seeing it. Or even if you've not got family coming on, just seeing your, your business moving on to someone else, whether it be someone else purchasing it or someone else coming in and with a joint venture type thing. It, it, you know, it's about people. It's just, much, just as much about people working um, within the farm and uh, even on our point to, to uh, the customers as well you know we obviously have direct sales and we've got customers and they've all got an investment in it to some degree so yeah you just know deep down when everything's content yeah i mean for myself I, i've still got a, a long way to go yeah i have a lot of work on the hill to do and i know just from like the other weekend i went ended up doing a bit of silaging because there were a bit of spare land i needed to tidy up and i spent all weekend on a tractor well, two and a half days, and it, it sickened me, absolutely sickened me. I, I soon to spend a morning setting electric fences up, and I'm, I'm done for a week, if not longer. It's, yeah, it's just a, I've got a long way to go, I know, but it's getting there slowly. Right, uh, we could witter on for ages about this, so um, has anyone got any particular questions they, they'd like to throw out, and we'll see what we can come up with. Sorry, um, 
Could you tell us a bit about stocking rate for cows and calves on the cell grazing and um, also about the, def the deferred grazing and whether you have to supplement on the deferred grazing and how long you have to leave to get a good overwinter deferred grazing? Um, do you mean stocking rate or stocking density? Density. Okay. Density. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so those cows, I've you know, sort of set them. There's a bunch of 32 uh, this year. They are on 0.9 of a hectare for three days. Um, again, you know, I'd like to ship them every day, but I'm not there. And the guy who's looking after them for me would prefer not to ship the electric fences. So that's fine. Um, but they really, they could be on um, sort of a quarter of a hectare a day for those 32 in the, the grass levels that are there. Um, supplementing them, well, the supplements growing out the ground. <laughs> um, in simple terms, if you could get the figure of 100,000 kilos per hectare, and that 100,000 kilos is livestock, so flip that back to dairy cows in round figures, that's 500 dairy cows on a hectare, yeah, and, uh, and that, that's relatively simple, and that's on a day, yeah, yeah. Um, and if, and if you can relate that back, then whether it's you know cow calf couples or whatever, but it's that that hundred thousand kids, and that'll give you that'll give you that animal impact then, because that's what you're after. But then you you, you know you you, you want to be looking at moving them. You can't just leave them on that for a week at a time, whatever. You got to keep them moving. Now to do when do on. you come back with them? How long do you leave? So again, rest period then is dependent on your farm, on your on your grass growth or whatever. But um, ideally, you want to be a minimum of thirty five days on it. But it's all it's all a movable no. feast, really. Um, yeah. It's uh, it when you first start, you're not going to be grazing long grass if you're move transitioning from a traditional approach, um, and that's going to restrict how much food you've actually got there for them, and therefore how how many animals you can put on for how long. Um, but the the key to it really is is the recovery, not so much the grazing. There are various different views on whether you should um, take a third and trample a third, whether you should total graze. They're, they're all different approaches and essentially you can all... It's, it's down to everyone to try these different approaches and see what works for themselves. But it's the, it's the recovery that's important, far more so than, than the actual grazing um, the for a start the the animals have got to learn to graze a different way and that takes a little while um, if you take a, a conventionally managed um, cow or sheep and suddenly start cell grazing it on very tight tight cells then they're they're going to be a little bit concerned about uh, about what you're doing with them um, but the higher you can, in, in essence, the higher you can get the, the stock density within reasonable limits and the sort of figures that, that Angus is talking about, um, the faster you'll see changes. Um, I, I was grazing uh, 35 suckler cows and their, their um, calves at foot on 2,000 square metre cells and doing daily moves. Um, I, I would have seen faster improvements if I'd gone to 1,000 square metre cells with them and moved twice a day. Um, but for my personal reasons, I just w wasn't going to put that amount of time in. And it's, it's whatever works for you. There's no right answer. There's just varying degrees of wrong answer. So, is Last question. Is there an ideal height you should be going into Grey's at? Anyone? Um, it's probably... You don't want to get fixated on height, it's on plant recovery. So, you know, using your eyes and, it's you know, you can graze at dairy level, three leaf, and be back in 21 days, but you're probably going to run out of grass unless you're chucking loads of fertiliser at it. Um, so, it's, yeah, when, you know, the ones that my, I spoke about before, they're going into, it's fully seeded, it looks, you know, like a hay crop. Um, there's another sort of herby lay, you know, the chicory is up here and you're sort of running the electric fence across the field and it's actually running across the chicory stalks rather than the electric fence. <laughs> um, it's just what, what works for you and letting those plants fully recover because if you go back before they're recovered, 
repeatedly, they're going to run out of steam, and that's when you get your, your weeds come in, such as your thistles, your docks. There's all these all this conventional wisdom about things as well that uh, you know there's there's no energy in grazing um, mature grass. Well, I don't know if Stuart Taverner's here today, but uh, showed him uh, what we were doing last year, and uh, I'd got store cattle in in grass that was about so high, um, gone to seed, um, and they were they were preferentially taking all the seed heads off. Well, surely that's some form of cereal supplementation. What's a cereal if it's not a, um, a developed grass? Uh, and they looked bloody good on it. Um, so it's, it, it is about this thing of looking at things differently and changing your mindset. And um, they, they had grazed in tight cells with their, their mothers the year before. Um, they weren't phased by going into long grass. Um, and yeah, they... They did well on that. We weren't supplementing at all. Um, and if you can get a good mix of, um, of different species going in the pasture, then it becomes much less critical about mineral supplementation and, um, and that side of things. Uh, you also get lots of phytochemicals from some of, these, uh, some of the, the herbs in the, in the pasture which help with um, pests and diseases within the animals. And... Uh, Briefly picking up on that, an awful lot of people think that you've got to uh, you've got to sow a herbal lay before you start. Well, it's it depends on what your time scale is. The seed for all these plants is actually in the soil. It's incredible just what seed bank there is in the soil, and if you change the management, you'll see the plants change. It may not happen overnight. It may may take two or three years. But um, I know out walking across one of our fields. Um, the end of last week, we suddenly came across two or three orchids. And uh, we've never seen orchids at Holwell Court before. And this is actually on land which was dug for sand in the 1980s and backfilled with imported clay. Um, where the hell those seeds came from, I don't know. But they're there. Um, we're seeing sandfoin, we're seeing clovers, we're seeing all sorts of things in there that on that particular field that I never planted. Um, they're, just, they're just there. Um, yeah, yeah. I could have spent a lot of money on on some of the other fields. I did go over with a with a Coxwold's herbal lay mix and overseed, um, with some success, and some of the plants didn't really do very well. But uh, it's about, as we say, it's about questioning everything you do. And the first question is, when you see something you don't like, well, why is that happening? Why is it there? Um, and invariably, it's because of the way you're managing things. And it's um, sorry, with the tall grass grazing, I wouldn't put young growing cattle in there and make the cow make them work as hard as the cows would you'd have to accept that you know if you make them take everything those cows are taking their their growth rates are going to plummet which you know if you're aiming for um sort of land improvement it's probably right but if you want to you know you've still got to pay the bills so in that sort of situation you probably run a leader follower with the youngsters going through and then your cows and calves coming through as the clean-up mob a, a couple of days later or space later. Yeah, they would. They they take the cream, and then the cows would take the the roughage and still do fine on it. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering how much flexibility do you have in your systems to account for the poor weather conditions you're bound to encounter. And are you able then to adjust where you're going to put the cattle onto the less risky fields when you know it's going to be raining for a week to uh, obviously mitigate soil loss into water courses and the like? You've answered your own question. Have a plan B. Yeah, always have a plan B in that, um, as, you know, particularly with this outwintering. Um, if you, you know you're going to get a two-week bad period and you've just got to have somewhere where you know you can move them to... Um, they're just going to be able to, to ride the storm, so to speak. And that plan B could even be a building. Yeah. Simple just as that. because you're aiming to be regenerative doesn't mean that you don't use all of the tools that everyone else is using. It's just that you use them for the right reason at the right time. And if that is bringing them into a shed and feeding them a conserved feed for a short period of time to overcome a problem, then fine, do it. Um, we're, we're not necessarily saying that you, you would never use fertilisers or you'd never use agrochemicals. 
that you'd question why, um, and you, if you're really not sure about it, you practice somewhere first. You try a, a safe to fail area. Any other thoughts? So um, yeah, re really good to see you solve the problem of the water <laughs> problem. Um, on the dairy side, is there a similar thing with, with obviously the parlour problem with getting the cows back? Does that restrict what you can do with your rotations and are there solutions on the horizon for that? Cow infrastructure, yeah. Electric fencing, walkways, cow tracks. Essential, yeah. And, and just like you say about water around the paddocks. So, uh, again, it, it, it's that... Um, that up front, it feels like a massive investment at the time, but it isn't. In the big picture, you know, you know the, what you get back in growth potential of the grass just outweighs it completely. Yeah, so, sorry, I was just thinking, so in terms of um, whether you could have milking out, actually mobile milking with the, with the cows, following the cows in the way that... Yeah, there are guys doing that. We, we wouldn't do it on our farm. It's, it, it's, it's not really practical and the farm's geared up. And, and what we found it a lot more simple to do is just literally put cow tracks down, railway sleepers, um, and that, that made the infrastructure for the cows. No problem. Uh, one last question over there. Uh, so you're sort of briefly talking about... Um, Reduction in the use of like uh, like minerals, and like you've got a lot of grasses and your, your herby your herby lays coming through. Um, are you finding you can sort of reduce the reliance on lick buckets and bolusing, or are you still having to do that as part of your management? Um, I don't use any minerals. Um, well, I lie. <laughs> I use mag tubs for the cows in the spring. Um, too much of a risk on our sort of ground not to. Um, but other than that. No, don't get anything. Any views? We use mag in the water troughs, and that's it. And again, as the cows 100% grass fed, there's there's no supplements fed anyway, so it's not as even as there's anything going in in concentrate. But again, um, the whole system is under less stress. And coming back to this rest period of everything, if you like, you can call the once a day a rest period. Um, yeah, it, it, it's 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 ride with it. Yeah. So um, we put a general purpose lick bucket in with the sheep, more of a, to gauge whether they're, I, I work on the fact that if they take it, they're looking for it. If they're not, then we've got something, we're getting it right. Um, and I think the last general purpose lick bucket I put out lasted about three months. So I take it that they don't really want it. But last year, um, we were using a lot more lick buckets. They were taking, a lot, taking it a lot more. And then I started putting... Um, willow and alder in with them just putting trees in with them and they go absolutely mad for willow and since using that they've not worried they've not touched the lick buckets really so looking for alternative feeds is is quite is, that's been a bit of fun quite interesting to, to see what they're what they're looking for and what they're what they're happy to take i'm conscious we're about out of time so any any last thoughts the, the lady's Sorry? got a question Worming. Um, yes. Sorry, I came um, late. I, I fecal egg count, um, but I haven't yet got away from that mid-season grazing worm. Um, not for gut worm, for lung worm. Um, so you could say you, you should use huskback um, vaccine, but it's not really a practical vaccine, and it's bloody expensive. Um, so, yeah, mid-season worm and then housing worm still. Depend, depends how brave you are. Um, we're in a very dry part of the country. I'm 20 miles south of here. Uh, we haven't wormed in the last four years, and I did faecal egg counts last year, and I didn't tell the vet until the, we got the results back that we'd stopped worming. And uh, she congratulated me on our faecal egg counts and said, you're doing something right. And then I said to her, we haven't wormed for four years. So, yeah, she was quite surprised at that. Um, but it's got to be what works for your situation. If you're in a wet part of the country and you've got fluke problems, then, you know, uh, w however you graze, you would be a brave person not to not to use a flukicide. So it, it's got to be whatever works for your situation. And, and, and just last point, chicken for sheep and cows. 
click on sheep? Um, we do. We have done the lambs um, because they won't be shorn for a little while yet. Um, but we try and shear relatively early in the season before flies get bad, and then we generally don't have to. We've we've treated. I think we've treated one for, for maggots so far this year, and that's that's it. Right. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm sure if you if you bump into any of us.